right, today's lesson is on section 4-1, Impulse and Momentum. This is J. Oops. All right, so the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, what is momentum? Momentum, if you think about it, you want to keep going, right? So the me momentum actually definition is the measure of how hard it is to stop something. Stop an object in motion. In other words, something that has inertia or mass has momentum if it's moving. The formula is, of course, P equals mv. And since velocity has is a vector, momentum is a vector, which means that direction does matter. Now, units of momentum, it doesn't have any special units. So mass, of course, is kilograms, and velocity is meters per second. So momentum units are kilogram meters per second. Okay, it is a vector quantity. Which means that direction does matter. All right, the direction is in the same direction as the velocity. Now, there's a difference between momentum and impulse. Impulse is a force, okay? Think about the differences. Something that's rolling along the floor is going to continue to roll along the floor. It has momentum, all right? Um, impulse is more like what happens when you bounce a rubber ball on the floor. The rubber ball comes in contact with the floor for a very short period of time, but it's a very rapid change in that momentum, okay? So that's what we're seeing here. So an impulse is a force applied to a system over time. Uh, Impulse is J, okay, and J is force over time. Now, this is the physics one version of this. Now, the physics calculus version of this is J is equal to the integral of force over time, F dt, okay, F of t dt. And both impulse and momentum are vector quantities because force is a vector quantity, then impulse is also a vector quantity. Now, remember what I said, impulse is um, very rapid changes in, it's a force, it's a very rapid change momentum. And what we see is we see the impulse momentum theorem that an impulse causes a change in momentum. In other words, impulse J is equal to the change in momentum. All right, the force is the rate at which the momentum is changing. In other words, we have is going to be equal to dp dt. The rate at which momentum is changing, p is momentum. Okay, so you've got dp dt. Now, if you take this and you look at it, what you end up with is, you end up with this, of course, it's a vector. p is a vector. You end up with this guy being m dv dt plus v dm dt. Now, some of you are probably going to be like, why is that? Well, remember, P is mv. So what you have is you have force equaling d dt of mv. Well, that is a product. So what you're getting is the product rule. Okay, think about it. Remember, product rule in calculus is f times g, fg, uh, the integral of, or the derivative of that is f prime g plus g prime f. That's what you're getting here, is you're getting d dt of m times v, and then you're getting plus m times dv dt, okay? So this is just the product rule version of that. So this, using the product rule, leads us to this. Okay, so F equals MA is a special case of the equation above for when mass is constant. So if the mass is constant, dm dt, that would make dm dt equals zero, 
which would make this whole portion of it zero out, which would leave you with m dv dt, and dv dt is a. So f equals ma is a special case of the equation. All right, so all of the math does work out. So how do we apply the impulse momentum theorem? We've got a 0.1 kilogram tennis ball hitting a racket with a speed of 10 meters per second. It rebounds in the opposite direction with the speed of 10 meters per second. The ball is in contact with the wall for a very short period. Find the average force exerted by the racket on the ball. So we know that impulse is equal to the change in momentum, which is equal to FT. So what we know is that FT is equal to P final minus P initial, which is of course MV final minus MV initial. Okay, so let's figure out what this is. Find the average force. Well, the force then is going to be equal to this M times V final minus V initial divided by T. And that gives me this. So, because this is FT right here. All right, so let's plug in some numbers and see. We have the mass, which is 0 0.10 kilograms. We have the final velocity is going to be, and signs are important here. Remember, velocity is a vector. The final velocity is 10 meters per second, but it is going in the opposite direction. So that is negative 10 minus positive 10, because that's going in the correct direction, and then over 0 0.005. So what we get is approximately 400 newtons. It is force. And if you think about it, why is it newtons? Because mass is, if we look at our units here, we have, um, mass is kilograms, this is meters per second, and per second. So kilogram meters per second squared is newtons, isn't it? So know your, know your uh, units. It says the ball changes velocity, if you notice a special note here, the ball changes velocity but not speed when rebounding. However, the change in velocity is what matters, okay? Think about it. So you've got 10 meters per second. This is a positive, this is a negative. And because it changed, it had to basically come to a stop and start again. There is a huge amount of force involved in that quick turnaround of velocity going from one direction to a stop to the other direction, all right? So this answer makes sense if you think about it, all right? All right, now we got Example B, a continuous changing mass momentum problem. And I have seen these before many times in on the free response question uh, uh, portion of the exam where you have the mass changing. Because most people are comfortable with the velocity changing, but are you comfortable with the mass changing? So we've got gravel falls vertically on a conveyor belt at a rate of uh, sigma uh, kilograms per second as shown, determined one, the force that must be applied on the belt to keep it moving at a constant speed, V. So, section I, we are looking for the force, which is equal to what? dp dt. Well, we know that is m dv dt plus V dm dt. Now, constant speed means that this dv dt goes to zero. So we're really just looking at the velocity times the um, dm dt. Well, it told us the gravity falls vertically, or the gravel falls vertically at a rate of sigma kilograms per second. So dm dt is this guy right here. Okay, so now two, it says the power that must be supplied by the motor turning the belt. Well, you guys know that power is equal to FV. Okay, well, what is F? Well, we know F is V this guy, and the velocity of the change in the velocity of the gravel, the velocity of the gravel is going to be this also, so times this again equals squared. Okay, and then finally, wants to know the rate at which the kinetic energy 
of the gravel is changing. So we want to actually know K which is one half mv squared. So that is one half m. Well, if you think about it, it's really what? It's really k dk dt is really what it is. So really what we've got is we've got same thing happening all over again where we use the um, power rule. So we've got one half sitting out here at the front and we're going to do M DDT of V squared plus DM DT of V squared. Well, V moving at a constant speed, this is again, this dvdt is going to go to zero. So what we have is one half and we've got dm dt, which is sigma times v squared. Okay, so there's our answer. It says explain why the answers to two and three are different. Okay. Well, what is power? Power, if you think about it, is the rate at which energy is changing. But... KDT is less than the power. Now, why is that? Some energy is lost. Why? Think about what's the sand doing. The sand is falling coming in contact with the conveyor belt and stopping there. It's an inelastic collision. We'll talk about this more. Not the sand with the belt. Okay. So now, how do we apply conservation of momentum? What is conservation of momentum? By impulse momentum theorem, one thing we do know is that outside forces acting for a time that would be FT is change in momentum, right? So they change momentum. And of course we should say of the system. Okay? So, in an isolated system, we know what isolated means, no external forces acting, we have conservation of momentum. And this is literally conservation of momentum. What we know is that the velocity of the center of mass, and we'll get into that concept too, is constant. Okay, the velocity of the center of mass is constant. In other words, we have two objects coming together and they are going to collide. Here they collide, right? So what happens? When they collide, 
if they're different masses, then one is going to go one way, one is going to go the other. But with the direction that they go, or if they stick together, they'll travel together some direction. That is actually dictated by, if you looked at the center of mass of the system, that never changes. It continues on at the initial velocity it was going at the very beginning. So whether one bounces and comes back or not, okay? Um, so I want you to think this through. We have said impulse momentum theorem says an outside force acting changes the momentum, but we've just said an isolated system has no outside forces acting on it. Therefore, the momentum must not change. Does that make sense to you guys? Now you can have internal forces that can change the momentum in certain objects in a system, but they have no effect on the momentum of the system as a whole. Does that make sense? If you don't have an impulse, you don't have a change in momentum and momentum is conserved. Okay. So let's look at example C. We've got momentum here. We've got two masses traveling together to the right as shown. So the whole thing connected by a spring and one mass of M and one of 2M traveling to the right at velocity V. The massless spring is fixed to um, a bigger block. The spring compresses and the spring force causes a smaller block to travel to the left uh, with a velocity of V. Find the new velocity of the larger block after the spring decompresses. So what we know and what we always do is we use conservation of momentum, which says that the initial momentum has to equal the final momentum, okay? And we're going to say right is the positive direction, okay? So what do we know? We know initially that we have the entire thing, which is m plus 2m, traveling to the right at V. Afterwards, however, we have the smaller masses traveling to the left at V. And we want to figure out what the 2M larger mass is doing, so V final. All right, so now we're just going to solve this for V final. So we have 3MV equals negative MV plus 2M V final. So we're going to add this mv to the other side. We have 4 mv equals 2 mv final. Divide by 2 m. Ms go away. And we end up with v final being 2 v. In other words, positive 2. So it is going twice the velocity, twice the initial velocity, and to the right. Spaceship ejects fuel uh, over time as shown. The fuel is ejected at speed of VE. As the fuel leaves the ship, the ship loses part of its mass, dm. So this is a change in mass problem. It also gains a certain velocity, dv. Determine the expression part first one. So look at the picture. We have m plus dm going at v. And now afterwards, this is the after picture. We have dm being ex um, gotten rid of, being ejected at velocity e, we have m left and v plus dv velocity. So the velocity is increasing to the right um, when the mass is ejected to the left. Determine the expression for the velocity of the rocket over time. So we're ejecting at ve, it's losing part of its mass dm, Gaining a certain velocity dv. So we know that this is, we start with conservation of momentum. P initial equals p final. We okay, so here we are, conservation of momentum. So what is our initial before state? We have 
All right, so where we're sitting here is conservation of energy. Um, sorry, conservation of momentum. We're starting with m plus dm going at velocity v. And we're ending up with dm going v minus v sub e. But it is going in the... Um, yeah, that's correct plus m times v plus dv. Okay. So what do we end up with? We end up with mv. We end up with mv plus dmv plus dmv here minus dmv sub e, which makes sense plus mv plus mdv. Oh, this is the same on both sides, so it goes away. This is the same on both sides, it goes away. So we end up with actually, um, dmv sub e over here if we move this over, and mdv on the other side. Okay, so what do we wanna do here? I'm actually trying to find um, the velocity over time. So actually, I want to swap these around and say mdv over here equals dmve over here. Well, I need to get v from dv, so I'm going to have to integrate. Okay? So I'm going to integrate these, and I'm going to integrate them from some initial value v naught to whatever the mass is over time. So my integral values start at v naught and then go v of all the way to v of t. Um, I want dv by itself and I want the m over with the dm. So I'm going to say I'm going to integrate from some initial mass to some mass over time. And this is going to be 1 over m, because I divided both sides by m. v sub e is going to be out here, because it's a constant, um, and dm. So, what do I get? Well, I get v of t, which is the integral of dv, v over time, which is equal to um, from v naught. Well, actually, what I get is, excuse me, let me write this properly. I get V. So this becomes what? This becomes V from V naught to V sub T, V of T, excuse me. Integral of 1 over M dm is going to be natural log of M. So we're going to do natural log of M. And we've got, of course, I'm going to put my negative or positive v sub e out here. That's so messy. Let's just do this the right way. v sub e natural log of m from m naught to m of t. Okay, so what do we end up with here? We end up with v of t minus v naught on this side, and we end up with v, of v sub e times the natural log of m of t minus natural log of m naught, which can be combined. So we have v of t minus v naught equals v sub e and this just becomes natural log minus becomes uh, subtraction becomes division of m of t over m naught. And then all we're going to do is, uh, I would say that would be the velocity in terms of this. I would probably move my v naught to the other side. So v of t is going to be equal to v sub e natural log m of t over m naught plus v naught. Okay. So now, 
thrust of the rocket. Thrust of the rocket is a force that is going to be dpdt, which is of course going to be ddt of mv, which is mdvdt plus V sub E, the MDT. Okay. Now, why is it V sub E? Because that's what's causing it. That V sub E going backwards is what's causing an, an additional force going forward, the ejection. Now, we know DVDT is going to be what? If it is a constant velocity, then dvdt goes to zero. So we know that this is just V sub E, the mdt. And that will be our general thrust equation. Which is kind of important to know. The force is caused by the ejection velocity of the mass. And that would be since the mass is changing as more and more particles are thrust out of the back of the rocket, so to speak, or the spaceship in this case, at a velocity, ejection velocity, that is causing a change in momentum, which is causing an impulse, which is forcing it up. If that makes sense. All right, that's the end of this lecture. You need to, you will be working on 4-1 um, in class.